and welcome to a special edition of Banfield. And I have to say, um, special doesn't do this one justice because this is one story for the full hour, one exclusive story, an interview with the only living person who can help solve a mystery that honestly, my friends, should not be a mystery at all. Micah Miller died by suicide. That happened back in April. And if you had told me in March that we and all the other networks and the internet uh, would be covering her death like a high-profile murder, I wouldn't have believed it. It took investigators very little time to establish that Micah did, in fact, end her own life on her own all by herself. But disturbing details of that life poured out just as quickly. A life centered on an erratic controlling and seemingly vindictive husband who's the pastor of a South Carolina church and whom she was in the process of divorcing. That pastor's name is John Paul Miller, JP to his friends and to his family. And while there's a paper trail from here till Sunday that documents the couple's turbulent marriage, the GPS trackers that JP put on Micah's car, uh, her tires that he allegedly slashed, And, oh, right, that topless photo of Micah that he reportedly posted online. One indisputable fact remains, and it cannot be forgotten. John Paul Miller has not been formally accused or charged with anything related to Micah Miller's death. Micah was 30 years old and had been living apart from JP for more than a year when she got in her car in Myrtle Beach on April 27th alone and drove to a pawn shop where she bought a gun and ammunition. She made another stop at a gas station and then she drove to the Lumber River State Park in North Carolina, right across the state line. And it was there that she dialed 911, telling the operator exactly what she had planned for that Saturday afternoon in the woods and where exactly they could find her body. Took about 10 minutes, 10 minutes and they found Micah Miller's body. And though JP had an alibi and it was verified and police had receipts and videos and Micah's own words pointing to suicide, Micah's family and Micah's friends and seemingly half of the internet believed that John Paul of the Solid Rock Church was responsible for Micah's death. If he didn't pull the trigger himself, the theory went, he drove his poor wife to do it. Again, JP has not been charged with any crime related to Micah Miller's death. He also hasn't done much talking about all of this outside of a church service and a couple of text messages, but now he is talking. And he's talking with News Nation. The Reverend sat down with our Rich McHugh for a wide-ranging gloves-off interview that you're not going to see anywhere else. It is at times uncomfortable, It is occasionally shocking, and some parts are just plain weird. I want to get straight to part one. John Paul on the suicide, the speculation, the nonstop suspicion, plus the alibi that satisfied the police, if not his haters. You and I have been talking since this happened, basically, communicating over text. Why now? Why the decision to speak now after all this time has passed? Where's your head at? Um, well, I, I think part of it is I finally got the approval of my attorneys to do so. They, um, the ones working on the defamation cases, they said um, it's easier to win a defamation case the more the people talk. And so they've been collecting uh, a lot of evidence over the past uh, while. And, um, and also, I think that uh, now that some of the emotion has died down in the world and with, with people that are led by their feelings, I think now um, they deserve to hear um, some logic and some truth and, um, and make their own assessment. Do you miss her? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Did you feel, did you see this coming? Yes, but it doesn't change at all the the power of the pain of reality. I, I saw it coming for years. I told them for years this would happen over and over. I said if she gets off her medicine, 
uh, suicide is, is the next thing. You know, she, she tried it in the past, but with me, uh, she always remained okay with me. She was on her meds with me. She was healthy and happy. And even if she did get low or stopped taking her medicine, I would help her get back on it, and things would be fine without me and with her family. Uh, she's off meds, and she committed suicide. And, and, and I told them this would happen over and over again. Um, I tried my best to stop her from getting a gun. I went to judges. I have, I have copies of all the, the police. I talked to her counselor, the pastor she was going to, um, her family, her friends. I told them all, don't let her get a gun. Do whatever it takes. Prevent her from getting a gun. And, um, and when she was with me, she was never able to um, go that far. Uh, but with them, that's, that's exactly what happened. And it... And it uh, destroyed me and uh, I still honestly I still haven't really grasped it like it hasn't I kind of keep putting off the reality of it and um, I try not to think about it as much as I can what was going on in your marriage the week Micah died the week she died we didn't talk that entire week I'd emailed her several times that week and my regular emails are sending her letters telling her that I love her and um she, she came over to the house. The last time I saw her was uh, a few weeks before she passed away. We spent about four hours together. And uh, we hugged and kissed. And she was in and out of psychotic um, conversations. She would say, you know, one thing about double agents that are following her. That was one of the phrases she would use when she was off her meds, double agents. The other phrase she would say, she wants to come home so bad, but her family won't let her. Um, she told me she wanted to live in Africa and asked me if I'd live with her. I said, sure, if you take your medicine, you know. Um, and so um, she told me uh, if I'd give her some money and if I would uh, write her um, a letter saying certain things in this letter that she would take her medicine. And so I tried that. And, um, but she desperately wanted to come home. She was just so afraid her family would disown her. And so the week before she passed away, um, I probably emailed her maybe seven or eight times that week just saying, I love you. You need your lithium. You know, don't forget who you are when you're on medicine versus who you are when you're off. She had lost 40 pounds in a month, and nobody that it was in her life thought to take care of her. Nobody. She was living with a, a former registered nurse. Her family, quote unquote, were taking care of her. She lost 40 pounds in one month, and no one thought she needed help. She was talking about living in Africa. No one thought she needed help. She's making videos on Facebook. And if you see the videos, you know it's not her because she has a different cadence, a different tone, a different amount of words per minute when she's healthy uh, and on medicine than when she's off. And the way she was even looking into space when she's taking those videos, you knew she was delusional. And if somebody loved her enough to take her to a professional and say, okay, this woman says she's being abused or this woman says, you know, this or she's lost 40 pounds in a month. If someone thought I need to take her to a professional, that professional would have known that she needed medicine. And uh, the reason I know that's true is because I took her a few months before, she, uh, a few weeks before she passed away, I took her to probate court. And in three minutes time, three minutes time, she went in, she walked back out. When I went in, they said, your wife is uh, mentally ill and she needs medicine desperately. And I said, okay, let's, let's, let's do it. Let's get her the medicine. Let's get her help. And they said, she's not a danger to anybody in society, so we can't force her to do it. But if one of her family members or friends had taken note of the way she was acting and seen what was happening to her physically and taken her to just one professional, they could have saved her life. Where were you when Micah died? I was, it was on a Saturday. I was in Charleston with about 100 people from my kids' school. What, what, what was it? Oh, soccer. It was a soccer tournament. Okay, so we know, you know, I've, I've gone through Micah's last day uh, pretty much almost down to the minute. Um, what, bring us through your last day. Uh, you said soccer. Were there any, do you have any documentation that they were there? Oh, you're, you're, uh, you're asking because, you, okay, I got you. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah, I can't believe people. Oh, my Lord. So, yeah, I was with about 100 people. We had dinner that night. We were all together at the soccer fields that day. Um, afterwards, um, after the soccer game, I was somebody was with me the entire time um, who I can't name due to legal purposes, but I will say it's somebody that I love more than anything else on planet Earth. Man or woman? Um, young person that I cannot name due to legal purposes, um, but somebody that I am responsible for and love very, very much. And that person was with me, and we went shopping in Charleston, and we got food in Charleston, and um, there's all the receipts from that throughout the time. We got, I think we might have gotten gas too, and then I uh, made it back to, um, and made it back to Myrtle Beach. And I even, I was just actually looking today at emails that I sent her that day. I sent her four emails that day, and um, I just noticed today that two of those, um, she wasn't able to read because it was after it had happened. What do you think happened that day? 
So according to what she's tried to do in the past, and according to her doctors who have taken care of her for years, and according to me who's seen it over and over again, um, I imagine that she was in an incredibly euphoric attitude. I saw her pictures on the Dick's Pawn Shop. Someone sent me screenshots of the Dick's Pawn Shop pictures where she's smiling, which out of the six or seven times that she tried to commit suicide in the past, only one of those times was she depressed. The other times she was very euphoric. And she would wake up and say, I think I'm supposed to die today. And I said, no, 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 honey, you're not, you're not going to do that. She said, well, my mind tells me that I'm supposed to kill myself. I said, we're not going to listen to your mind. We're going to take you to a doctor and get you help. And I discovered, of course, that she had stopped taking her meds each time. But either way, she was in a euphoric attitude. And so you see the Dick's Pawn Shop video where she's wearing her, um, her work clothes and um, with a smile on her face. So they sold her a weapon, and then um, I assume that she drove. She told one of her best friends, so far, her four, the four people she spent the most time with every week, no one's interviewed or talked to those four people. And one of those people that I talked to told me that she told her two years ago, if I ever commit suicide, I'm going to go to this place in Lumberton, the state park or something like that. Which so, friend is that? Um, I probably wouldn't want to name her because I saw this friend, uh, one time here in public for 30 seconds. And, of course, Robbie, S. Harvey, as usual, got somebody to take a picture and destroyed the girl's life, brought up her past and horrible things about her. So people are scared to tell the truth or to talk about the good things of Micah because of the social media. So um, this moms. friend says that Micah told her, if I'm going to take my life, I will probably do it in Lumberton River State Park. She told me that after Micah passed away, but she told me that Micah told her that two years ago, yeah. Did she say why? Why that location? She said because Micah told her it was peaceful and outdoors. And Micah did love the outdoors. Loved the outdoors. Vacations were outdoory vacations because that's what she loved. But so Has she ever been there? No, not that I know of. Not ever that I know of. Do you guys have any connection to that area? Not at all. I never have even you ever heard been of there? It. Nope. I've never even heard of the place. I've never even heard of what was the city Robinson County. I've never even heard of there before. So did it strike you as, before you heard this, did it strike you as odd when you heard that she where she went and what they say allegedly happened? Did you question it at all? Well, I didn't think it was real. I thought her family had made it up and had somebody call me and say that. So that's one big thing. I didn't think it was real. When I found out it was real, you know how, like, um... You know, like you tell somebody something, you tell them, you tell them, you tell them, you tell them. And then when it happens, you don't want to say, I told you so, because it's a horrible thing. That's what I felt like. I felt like I told y'all, like I told her family this so many times you can't imagine. I told her friends this. I told everybody. I said, if y'all don't get her her lithium, she's going to commit suicide. Her doctor told her this on paperwork where her doctor said this. And, and then when I get the call, I felt, I just felt like, I felt like the world's biggest failure because I spent the past three months when she, when her family got her out of the hospital mm-hmm. and didn't bring her home and her dad talked her into buying him a car and all this stuff was happening that was all crazy. I made a vow that I was going to do something every single day to try to get her back on her lithium and save her life. And so every day I did something. Sometimes I did four, five, six, seven things. Some days it's just one thing. But every day, whether it was an email, a text, visit someone, talk to a family member, talk to a friend, go somewhere, go to a judge, go to probate, I'm going to do something to save her life. And I spent every single day for those three months doing that. So getting that phone call (coughs) made me feel like the world's uh, greatest failure. I was was against the whole world because everyone told me that it wasn't true and that, 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 that um, I was making it up and that whatever they were saying. So it was me against the world for three months and I failed. What was the call and who, who was the call from and what did oh, they say? Oh, man, that's, it was a man. I got a call and it was, um, I think, I think it was a detective, I think. Mm-hmm. And he, I remember him being very calm and very nonchalant. And so that's why I thought, well, this is not real. And so I started screaming. I had a family member that was there with me. I started screaming for them to use their phone to call the hospital where the guy said she was at. And um, my family member called the hospital and said it was real. And I still didn't believe it. And so I called a, um, a police chief that I know somewhere around here, a captain or somebody. And I said, um, there's a detective named such and such on the phone telling me these things. 
like, is this real? Is this, is this a real person or not? And that person told me that it was real as well. And I just remember... I remember screaming really loud and uh, throwing up everywhere. And... Um, what did they tell you? Um, I remember throwing up... Did I have spaghetti that day? It was a lot of throw up. It was something red. I'm sorry? What did they tell you? Um, I don't remember that. Oh, no, I don't remember that. Hold on. I don't remember what he said. My family member called the hospital and spoke to, I think, either the head nurse or medical examiner or somebody. And that lady read me stuff that the Robinson County, I guess, had wrote on a piece of paper. And she was reading me suicide and the weapon and the where it was at and uh, all these different facts. And so then I, because the detective would not tell me it was suicide. And then I called him back and told him what the hospital told me and he was pissed off and asked me who that lady's name was and I didn't know her name and if I didn't know I wasn't going to tell him anyway because I'm glad she told me anyway and so um, and I said is this stuff true and I can't remember if he said yes or just hung up I don't remember I don't remember do you remember what he said though no man I don't, I don't remember at all if I try to if I try to if I try to enunciate it I'll probably be making something up based on all the crashing of everything going on. So I, don't, I can't tell you for sure. Did you ever question the findings that the authorities gave to you that this was suicide? No. I mean, I'm not a detective. I, you know, I watched Scooby-Doo growing up, but that's what everybody seems to be acting like is they're you know, part of the mystery machine. But my Lord, like, let my wife, let her, let her, let her, be at peace. Like she's in heaven, she, she's not worrying about all this stuff. Let her, let her rest. Let her memory rest. She had suicidal um, tendencies over and over, year after year, off medication especially. She went to Dick's Pawn Shop before, purchased a weapon, and tried to do the same thing. Uh, she drove out in the middle of nowhere. She called nine one one, left a voice message. I, I don't really understand what else could be. But you know what? I'm not a professional, so I don't know. In other words, it all added up to you. It made sense to you. I mean, I'm not a detective. Um, if, if she had heart surgery, I'm not going to question the heart surgeon. I just, I don't know anything about detective work at all. Right, but it's your wife. I mean, it's, and them telling you her, her life has ended. Are you trying to ask me if I think somebody murdered her? Do you think anybody murdered her? No. We have to take a quick break, but don't go anywhere. There is a lot more of News Nation's exclusive interview with John Paul Miller coming up, including questions about the very day after Micah's death, when John Paul disclosed it to his congregation in a bizarre sermon, a sermon in which he revealed private details of her mental health and referred to her suicide, but went to great pains to avoid mentioning her name. Um, I got a call late last night. My wife has passed away. And, yeah, and it was uh, it was self-induced, and it was uh, up in North Carolina. John Paul Miller explains that video coming up next. Just days before Micah Miller's dead body was found at the Lumber River State Park in North Carolina, Micah had served divorce papers to her estranged husband, Pastor John Paul Miller. So perhaps it wasn't a huge surprise that Pastor Miller got a lot of scrutiny right after her death. Micah hadn't been gone a full day when the pastor delivered a sermon, a bizarre sermon to his congregation, uh, a sermon announcing her death. And then inexplicably, he told the church that she'd taken her own life after a long struggle with mental illness. Uncomfortable. And things got even more unusual from there. During his eulogy to his late wife, Micah, he claimed to lay next to her dead body in the morgue and then claimed he tried to raise her from the dead. Here's how he put it. I got a call late last night. My wife has passed away. And yeah, and it was, it was self-induced 
and it was uh, up in North Carolina. And um, we're going to have a funeral for her next Sunday here at 3 p.m. And so um, it's, it's all I can be. Yeah, I'm, I'm just kind of going on um, adrenaline right now. So y'all pray for me and my kids and everybody. And uh, she was, she wasn't, y'all knew that she wasn't well mentally. And that uh, she needed her, her medicine that was hard to get to her. I got this lay next to her body and been down with her body about four times this week. And each time it still didn't hit me. Um, I thought she was going to wake up. You know, I even tried to raise her from the dead uh, one time this week. News Nation correspondent Rich McHugh asked Pastor John Paul Miller about those comments and those moments. And here's his reaction. One of the things that raised eyebrows initially for the public was when you gave a sermon here and you announced publicly uh, that she had committed suicide. Uh, and you talked about, you attributed it to her mental health. Why did you feel the need to come out with that at that moment? That's a great question. So first let's discuss why I preached that morning. Is that okay? Okay, so people have been asking that. So have you, have you ever taken any psychology classes or anything like that? Very few. Okay, yeah, I haven't taken any. So I would love to find a book or a psychology professor or someone that could tell me the correct response when you spend seven years trying to keep someone alive by just taking a few pills that their family tells them not to take. Then when they don't take it, they go into a hospital, their family takes them out, and then you spend three months trying to get them help when her family's telling them that you're evil and the bad person. And then it finally happens, the thing that you've been dreading for seven years, then you're trying to prevent for seven years, then it happens. I don't know what the correct response is, right? Am I supposed to stay home and cry? Am I supposed to go out with my friends? Am I supposed to go to a bar and drink? I don't know what the right thing is. Right? As a pastor, should I just get on my knees and pray? I mean, I want to die in that moment. And so the next morning, I remember thinking, okay, if I stay home, I'm probably going to kill myself. I'm probably going to just go to heaven and be with her and be done. Because I need to be around people, but I don't want to be around people and come to church if I'm not going to preach. Because then I'll be judging the guy that's preaching the whole time. And I can preach just as easy as I can breathe. So I'm just going to go in the mode of what I'm normally going to do and just continue my life normally until I finally have to deal with what's going on. And so I didn't know what else to do. I didn't know the right response. I wish somebody had told me, if I, in hindsight, uh, if I go back in time, I probably would have done the same thing and still preached. And then at the end, and the sermon was about leaving your legacy and, and the people you leave on earth and, and, and your memory that's being left. So I thought, maybe that's God. Then I thought, you know what? Micah would want me to preach. That's exactly what she'd want me to do. She'd be telling me to do it. She'd be trying to force me to do it. So I preached. And then at the end of the sermon, when I made the announcement, the announcement was made, and of course, I'm not in a clear thinking frame of mind. I mean, it's like, you know, it's not like I'm, you know, kumbaya and got it all together. Um, I, I said what I said because I didn't want them to think that it was because she's a bad person, or I wanted them to know, like, what, what, if Micah does anything that's out of character, it's because of her mental illness. It's not because of her. Like, she's a wonderful woman, full of integrity. When she's on her medicine, she, she's black and white, does the right thing, does not like the wrong thing being done. Off medication, she's a totally different person, and I didn't want them to see her as um, someone that was bad. I wanted them to know it's just a sickness, like if you have heart disease or if you have, you know, diabetes or whatever, mental illness, you need med- medicine to continue going forward. And so um, that's why I said that. Also, something I found interesting in that moment, you said, before I tell you this news... I'm going to paraphrase here. I'm going to tell you this news, and I don't want you. I want you to leave. I don't want you to stand up and talk about it. Why? That's a great question, and that was actually intentional because the last thing I wanted to hear was people talking about my wife. I wanted them to go home and take it to Jesus before they start, you know, doing what some Christians like to do and just chatter, chatter, chatter. And I didn't want to experience the extra pain. I didn't want to be mad at somebody in my church because I heard them say, "Well, you know." I'm not even going to guess at what somebody could have said, but I didn't want anybody to say anything negative about my wife. Another point of concern, let's say, for people watching was when you you gave a eulogy. was something concerning. People said that was concerning that you said that you tried to raise Micah from the dead. And I, I believe at another point you said you laid next to her body in the morgue. Is that true? I didn't lay next to her body. I mean, I laid, I, I, I couldn't, you can't lay next to her because she's, this, her body's up on this thing. But I mean, I hugged her and um, I sat on the floor, you know, next to her and just talked to her for a while. 
Um, but yeah, I tried raising her from the dead. Because you know what? If it had worked, we'd have a whole different story. But God forbid me not try it and always wonder the rest of my life, would it have worked? Right? Jesus did it. Elisha did it. There's a few other people in the Bible. And so, um, yes, if, if somebody I love more than anything in the world has passed away what I believe to be an early death, you better believe I'm going to try to, in Jesus' name, raise them from the dead. I believe in healing. I believe in miracles. I believe in the raising of the dead. I'm a one God, apostolic, tongue-talking, holy, rolling, born-again, heaven-bound believer in the liberated power of Jesus' name. I'm not ashamed of it. Well, you can't argue that it would certainly be a different story if he'd been able to raise Micah Miller from the dead. Still to come. Um, Remember the apology letter that John Paul Miller wrote to Micah Miller? Apologizing and admitting all of the awful things that he did to her, like tracking her car, slashing her tires, posting a nude photo of her online. Well, now the pastor says he didn't do most of that. He says he only wrote those things at her behest. And he's got a message for all his critics out there who say he drove her to suicide. We're going to play it for you next when our News Nation exclusive interview with Pastor John Paul Miller continues. It is always sad in retrospect to read the words of a person who takes their own life. But it's both sad and disturbing to read the words of Micah Miller that she wrote in divorce filings right before she took her life. She said that her estranged husband, Pastor John Paul Miller, abused her, quote, emotionally, sexually, spiritually, and financially, as well as physically. And she added, quote, in every way I can think of, end quote. Only days before she wrote these words, that husband sent her an apology letter in which he admitted to placing GPS trackers on her car, slashing her tires, and posting a topless photo of her online. Now, almost three months later, Pastor John Paul Miller is not only backtracking on that admission, he says he only wrote the letter to encourage Micah to, quote, take her meds, end quote. He also paints a very different picture of what his and Micah's relationship was like. Here's more of his conversation with News Nation correspondent Rich McHugh. Would you characterize your relationship with Micah as healthy? (laughs) Oh, man. We had, when she was on her medicine, we had the greatest marriage you could ever imagine. We spent every day together. I don't know any other couple that spent every day. So we wake up, well, she'd kind of wake up before me, but... You know, we'd go, to, we'd go work out together every day, five days a week. We'd eat lunch together every day. We would work together every day. We'd pick up the kids, just over the kids every day. We'd go to dinner every night together. Then every night we would have our routine. So there's three things we would do. We'd either sit in the bathtub together for two hours until the water went from steaming hot to ice cold. She bought this um, big air mattress we'd put in the back of the truck, and we'd go park somewhere here in Myrtle Beach where there's no lights, and we'd, she'd bring us some hot chocolate, and we'd lay on the air mattress for two hours. Or we would go out on the beach with our beach blanket and lay there for two hours. But the point was, no cell phones, just her and I. She would talk 90% of the time. I would talk 10% of the time, and I would just listen. And so every night, two hours, we'd hang out together. And so was our marriage healthy? It's probably as healthy as any other American marriage have you ever abused your wife? Never, not once in any way, shape, or form. I took better care of her than anybody could ever take care of her. Um, I never made her ask her to clean the house, not once in seven years of marriage. She never had to cook a single meal. She never had to work. She was never harmed physically in any way. In a letter, or in an email you wrote to Micah, you apologized, yes. right? You apologized for hiring, for tracking her, for uh, messing with her tires, for posting the picture. Um, so that's all true, right? So if I, I wanted, if I, great question. I'm so glad you asked that, actually. If I wanted to lie about that, I would just say I never wrote the letter, right? Because how can you prove that I wrote somebody's letter? There's no signature. There's no name. It's not in my handwriting. But I 100% wrote the letter. And I did it because the night that she was with me, the last night we were together for four hours, at one point, because the whole four hours I'm trying to get her to take her medicine. And then she said, my family doesn't want me to. They don't want me to come inside the house. Said, Maybe it's your house. Come inside. So if I would get to the point, she says, you know what? Um, I'll take my medicine and I'll come home if you'll give me $10,000 and if you'll um, write me an apology letter. So, so let me understand this correctly. 
the letter, that, the email that you wrote to Micah, apologizing for uh, hiring a PI, tracking her, uh, messing with her tires, uh, and posting a, a topless photo of her. You wrote that, you say. Yes, but sir. But now you're saying that you de- didn't actually do these things. I did the PI thing, um, but so over the years what I, I've learned with her is when she's in a delusional state of mind, I have to play into it in order to get her to get her back on medicine. So the first year or two when she'd say something, I'd say, that's not true, that's not real. She'd get mad and blow up and, you know, knock a hole in the wall or something like that. So then by December December 2019, I think it was, she um, we were watching TV and she just stopped and said, you're a double agent. And I said, no, I'm not. Double. She says, yes, you are. She said, and I'm going to call the police. She said, you're a double agent. You've stolen my things. And... Um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna put you in jail. And I was like, Oh my goodness, what do I do? She hadn't been taking her medicine. So just to be clear, you, you wrote this to Micah, but now you're saying you didn't do those things. No, I did not slash the tire. I did not. There was no, I don't think there's a naked picture of her anywhere ever. Anyway, I think that was just a made up thing. And I think that her tire just got something ran over, from what I understand. I don't know. I didn't see anything. Um, but I did hire the PI before. I did everything I could to stop her from getting a weapon. Everything you could imagine. I, I hired a private eye, and I said, uh, try, put a tracker on her car, and if she gets anywhere near a gun store, <clears throat> please let me know. Um, I, did, I did everything I could think of. <clears throat> and um, did, they, did that private eye alert you she never, that oh, day? No, I had stopped paying for it about three weeks beforehand, four weeks beforehand. Yeah. Why? Um, running out of money and um, people telling me that she was totally fine and I'm wasting my time. So what do you say to the doubters and critics who say you drove her to suicide? That's the dumbest thing I ever heard. She, she, so, wait, wait. She wasn't with me. Because, listen, with me, she didn't commit suicide. Apart from me for three months and with her family, she did commit suicide. One of the last things she showed me, she showed me a book she's reading called I Love Jesus, But I Want to Die. And I said, why do you want to die? She said, because I can't come home because my family won't let me. That's what I say to them. Still to come, there is no question John Paul Miller's behavior has seemed odd in the weeks and months since Micah died. And after the break, he tries to explain it, like why he dressed like Spider-Man and walked around his neighborhood and why he was squealing like a child while rolling around on the grass. And then the moment in John Paul's interview that shocked our whole crew. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. You need a minute? Oh, man. Oh, man. What on earth led to this? All that next. A luxurious hotel every day. I mean, think about it. It's been over two years, and still, the first thing anyone notices when they walk through the doors of our home is how amazing it smells. When Micah Miller died almost three months ago, her family and her friends most certainly hoped that she'd rest in peace. But that has not happened. Since that tragic day, her estranged husband, Pastor John Paul Miller has been the subject of whispers and rumors and rampant suspicion, even though the pastor hasn't been charged with anything. JP, as he's known to his family and friends, he's been very tight-lipped, saying almost nothing publicly about what happened to his wife and what happened between them before she died. But now he is talking, and he's talking to us. And he's answering all of our questions, even the ones that were uncomfortable and awkward and the ones that made him cry. Here is his conversation with News Nation correspondent, Rich McHugh. So sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. You need a minute? Oh, man. Oh, man. What's tripping you up? Just being able to tell 
just being able to talk about everything. It feels like um, uh, you know, people don't care to hear uh, the truth. They just um, they just want to go off of feelings and believe, you know, whoever screams the loudest rather than whoever, you know, has the proof. Do you feel that you did anything that you would change? Do you feel any part responsible? God, that's a great question. <clears throat> Man, that's such a good question. <clears throat> wow, what a good question. Can I have a second to think about it? Sure. Okay. Oh, my gosh, that's such a good question. What would I do differently? Oh, man. Oh, oh I know what i do. I know what i do. I know what i do. I would not involve her family when she's having mental episodes and is uh, schizophrenic and, and, you know, is, is off, off, off her meds. I would never have texted them. We've seen you dressed as Spider-Man in videos. Okay, let me just, her- wait, wait, hold on. I'm not Spider-Man. In your, I can either in confirm or deny. To me, it says Spider-Man as the as the person who's texting me. So we've seen you in videos dressed as Spider-Man. We know there's a Spider-Man character in your back, the back of your house somewhere. Um, her family says wonders if you have um, identity issues uh, and this need to align with superheroes. What's what's your reaction? What, what and what's the reason for? the Spider-Man? Well, first of all, I can neither confirm nor deny that I've ever put on a Spider-Man costume. But you'll never see me in the same room with Spider-Man, I will say that. And I don't know, people say stuff. Me and Micah would go You're to... Not, you, so you don't get in a Spider-Man costume? Yeah. I mean, you just sent me a picture with yeah, you and Spider-Man. Me and Micah, we'd go to Comic-Cons every year. We both dress up. Micah dressed up more than I did, actually. There are times I didn't dress up and she did. We love that kind of stuff. She would do, she was Wonder Woman, she was Spider Woman, she was um, Mystique, she was, um, she was a lot of different characters. So you're not even going to grant that it's, it, there's something odd here? No, I'm not. No. I, I, I put on the Spider-Man costume, I go see handicapped children. I'll, I'll go visit kids that, you know, love comic books and they're handicapped and I'll um, pretend like I'm Spider-Man and I'll take them a comic book and... Um, do videos with them and stuff like that. One of the videos that has surfaced recently is from years ago. And I, I'm sure you know what it is. It's you're sitting face down on the ground and you're freaking out <laughs> and you're you're talking about you're literally squealing about eat, being eaten by ants. Um, <clears throat> taking the wrong meds that you missed your family. <laughs> Is she a medication? Something they gave you? I mean, for viewers, for people watching it, the, the, the common thought is, what is going on here and do you have a drug problem? <laughs> so, so um, I fell out of a tree, a giant magnolia tree. It was like 300 years old. I broke 12 bones. It was 10. 10 to 12 bones. I don't know if you count fingers. Yeah, it was counting. Anyway, I have all this metal in my body, and um, I'd never taken pain meds in my life, and I just had my body cast taken off, um, and so I took a little bit too much pain meds that day. That's it? That's just it? what? That's Percocet? I, I don't remember any of them. It was 2017, 16? 16. 2016. 2016, and um, yeah, it was like 10 years ago, 8 years ago, whatever, and um. And I was missing my family. My, my wife, my, Micah, and I, we started through an affair. And so we were both married to people, and then we, you know, we got divorced. And I was missing my, my family because I'd lost my, you know, family at the time. And, um, and I was on pain meds, and it just all just went together. But fell out of a tree, broke a bunch of bones, took too many pain meds. And that was that story. Not hallucinogenics. No. What, is a, what would hallucinogenic be? Make you hallucinate. Well, what makes you hallucinate? Drugs. Like illegal drugs? Hallucinogenic drugs, yeah. Oh, I've never done a legal drug my whole life. Okay. Well. Oh, crap, that was a lie. I'm sorry, that was a lie. Um, When when I was 16 years old, one time I was in a truck with two of my friends, and they were both smoking pot. I didn't smoke any, but they do a thing called hot box. And so I got some of that. And I, I tried steroids one time. I remember President Clinton once saying that he didn't inhale either. Still to come, 
The fallout from Pastor John Paul Miller's blockbuster interview with News Nation. What does Micah Miller's family have to say about all of this backtracking and his erratic behavior? Uh, all of this strange stuff on the part of their former son in law. Maybe more importantly, what does law enforcement have to say? That's next. If the backstory is big enough, dramatic or tragic or mysterious enough, it can eclipse the actual story, which in the case of Micah Miller is a healthy young woman's sudden and untimely death. There's ample reason to accept the official conclusion that Micah took her own life, whatever led her to do it. But not everybody agrees. Here's what Micah's sister said to our Rich McHugh back in May. So over here would be where her remains are found down the river. And then all the way through this trail, all the way up here, was where her purse and her phone was found. And this water is not moving. It's just stagnant water. It's not moving at all. So presumably, uh, how would her, how would she... There is no logical explanation with the... um, just keep it on if you could. The theory of suicide does not add up to me because you're telling me her body floated all the way down this stagnant water. And From her belongings were all the way up here. We had to walk down a trail, a separate trail, climb through all this mud and trees and fallen debris to even get to where her body was, down the water. It's not like she could have you know, left her belongings mm-hmm. and walked down the water and then committed mm-hmm. suicide down here and then somehow the bullets and everything stayed over there. There's, there's no the logical... And was found up here. Mm-hmm. There's no logical explanation for this. Next week on our show, Micah's family responds to everything that you heard tonight from Pastor John Paul Miller. And Micah's own words in a phone message to her estranged husband, and it is not what you might think. Be sure to tune in. But that's it for tonight. Thanks for being here. Cuomo is next. Thank you. What are you going to do when all the trump maniacs come looking for you, brother? I'm Chris Cuomo, and that was Hulk Hogan, the spirit animal for the Trump convention. Manly men are back. Strength is okay. Canceling is canceled. And yes, Trump is the chosen one, literally and divinely. And yes, I said the Trump convention because there really is no party without him.